just FYI, Stacy came up with the questions. I have no idea what they are. In fact, I, I told her, this is my wife, by the way, if you don't know that. Um, for those of you who, this may be your first time, this is my wife, Stacy. I'm Tullian. Um, but um, she came up with the questions on her own. I don't know what they are. Um, I like it better that way. If I spend too much time thinking about how I would answer the question before it's actually asked, I don't do as well. Um, and so I'm like, why don't you come up with the questions roughly based on what we've studied in Ephesians, and then we'll just sort of, we'll take it from there. So she'll ask. If you don't like the questions, it's her fault. If you don't like the answers, right. it's my fault, right. okay? Um, so or now, either of them. What? Or either the question Right, or and if you answer. don't like either of it, then right. it's our fault. Right. Um, I am going to, I'm looking at my phone real quick, not because I'm intentionally trying to be rude. I'm, I'm, I'm going to set an questions. alarm you because the last Google time we, answers. no, the last time we did this, uh, we went over a little bit because there were three because. questions, right? <laughs> yes. And I preached the equivalent of three sermons in yeah, all he of said my prepare answers. prepare five questions. So we I'm got gonna, three, three of them. Right. So I am going to, uh, so what sh what time is it? It's uh, I'm looking at my I'm looking at my phone. I don't know the, what the time keys are it in is. your pocket, buddy. Um, <laughs> Ten fifty one. Okay, so I'm gonna set an alarm here. Oh, wow. For eleven o'clock. Every time we've set no, that an would alarm be when he's talking, he still it's like he hits snooze. So he goes beyond the the alarm. So I'm not sure if that's really gonna help us. I'm gonna see. Hold on. I'm gonna I'm gonna set it for I'm gonna set it for 85 minutes. So uh, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> for tomorrow. I'm gonna set it for two okay. and a half hours. So we should be good. Okay. I just started it. We got 35 minutes. All right. Well, let's hit it. Um, so, like you said, we have been in Ephesians and we've made it through five weeks. So if you if you've watched all of those, then you know it's he entitles each of them. Part one has a title. Part two, all of them have a title. So you can go back and watch any of these that we reference um, to see what he actually said about that particular part of the series, which it's been so great. And there's been so many people that have commented so far about this series because it's so funny to me when he kind of says, I'm struggling to prepare this sermon, or I don't really like this sermon I'm going to preach tomorrow. And then it is like, everybody's like, that's the best sermon you've ever preached. And people have this response to um, the things that he is not like really all into, you know, and, and feels good about. And so I love that God works that well, way. Well, it's, <laughs> it, it is, I do too, uh, <laughs> because it just goes to prove once again that I mean, we are tools. Yeah. We are tools. We are we are nothing more than clay in the potter's hand, That's and right. um, and it's true. I, I've had a real struggle preparing some of these sermons. Right. Just be, I don't know why. I sort of chalk it up to some kind of spiritual warfare, but I don't. Mm -hmm. I don't know why. It's just been mm -hmm. grueling to prepare. Saturdays have been a bear for me as I've prepared. Um, and you know, thankfully, God shows up and He does. You know, he's the primary preacher on Sunday mornings, as we say around here all the time. Um, it's his voice that we need to hear loudly and clearly. It's not mine. It's not my opinions that can set you free. It's God's truth that can set us free. And so whatever he does, I'm grateful for. Mm -hmm. Well, so in part one, you covered two scriptures. It was chapter one, verses one and two. Um and you entitled that sermon, The Root and Fruit of the Gospel. And could you just recap what the root and fruit of the gospel are? Yeah, so Paul, as you might remember, he always opens his letters, always opens his letters. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, I mean, always open Romans. He always opens his letters by introducing himself, telling the reader right away who's writing the letter, and then he says, grace and peace. And we typically read right past that. At least I used to read right past that, thinking it was nothing more than, uh, you know, sort of a customary salutation, uh, a customary greeting, that that's the way people would begin all of their letters. But Paul is way more intentional than that. The Apostle Paul is way more intentional than that. Um, and he uses those two words very intentionally. He uses the words grace and peace right at the beginning of all of his letters because he wants us to know from the outset 
the essence of the gospel, the essence of the good news that God delivers to sinners to set us free. And so he talks about grace, which is the root of the gospel, um, that everything about the gospel exemplifies God's one-way love to us. Uh, grace comes our way minus our merit. Uh, one of the ways that I describe grace or I've defined grace is grace is unconditional favor delivered to undeserving people by an unobligated giver. Okay, Or you could say that um, uh, grace is a liberating contradiction between what we deserve and what we get, uh, which is huge. I think a lot of people misunderstand who God is, that God is this um, sort of eternal policeman who's watching for us to screw up and loves writing tickets when we do. Um, and in essence, who God is is very, very different than that. Um, God is unconditionally loving. He's outrageously merciful. Um, he's amazingly gracious. And all of all of the gifts, in fact, we looked at this in chapter one, that um, all that we get that is good comes from God. We don't earn it. We don't deserve it. We don't work for it. Uh, it all comes from God to us. So that's grace. Paul wants to know that's the root of the gospel. And the fruit of the gospel is peace. The fruit of believing that to be true is peace. Um, and it's a struggle to believe that's true because we live in a conditional world with other conditional people. Um, we ourselves are conditional people. The way the world works and the way the world operates is that if we want something to happen, we have to work for it. We have to deserve it. We have to earn it. Um, but grace is a completely different system than that. Uh, and so it's hard to believe that God, knowing how bad I am and knowing how jacked up I am, it's hard to believe that God delights in me, that he loves me. It's very difficult to believe that. Um, it's, I've said this before, but it's easier for me to believe that God loves sinners than it is for me to believe that God loves me. One is general. It's a sort of a general statement. God loves sinners. That's not too difficult to believe because I read the Bible and I see that's clearly true. What's more difficult for me to believe is that God loves me, knowing my own heart, knowing my own life, knowing my struggles and my secrets and all of that stuff, all of my sins. It's hard for me to believe that a perfect, holy, righteous God would delight in me. Um, and so because it's hard to believe that, our lives lack peace. My life lacks peace. If I know, for instance, that God's that God loves me unconditionally, that means that I don't need you guys to like me, okay? I, I enjoy if you do like me, but I don't need you to like me because all of the love that I actually need, I already have. Well, when I believe that, it gives me peace because now if I say something or do something and someone doesn't like me because of it, I'll be okay because the one person whose love and acceptance I can't lose is God's. Uh, and so there's believing grace gives our lives peace. So on that note of peace in that same sermon, then you talked about the difference between peace with God and the peace of God, mm -hmm. um, which often gets confused and we think because we don't have the peace of God in our life horizontally with whatever circumstance is going on, that doesn't negate the fact that we have peace with God vertically. So can you just explain that a little bit? Yeah, so the Bible describes peace in two different ways. Peace uh, with God, which she just mentioned, and the peace of God. Peace with God is an is what I call an objective peace. It's it's peace that exists because of something God has done on our behalf. Um, the war with God is over because God in the person of Jesus has made peace with us because of Jesus's life and his death and his resurrection. Uh, there has now been a, there is now a ceasefire between God and me. Uh, God has made peace with me. Um, now I don't always feel that. And sometimes I feel like God is at war with me or that I am at war with God. Um, and circumstances in life at times make it feel, make life feel um, unpeaceful, tense. Uh, but the fact of the matter is when I am struggling with um, 
the peace of God. I don't feel like I have peace, okay? We hear that all the time when we're living life and we're experiencing circumstances and, and we kind of feel like we're, we're missing peace. Peace is missing. Um, oftentimes, what we end up needing to fall back on is the fact that despite the circumstances in our life or despite the way things aren't going, maybe the way we want things to go, um, we have peace with God. That when we are lacking peace horizontally, that does not mean that peace vertically has been interrupted. There is nothing that can interrupt peace with God because God himself has secured it for us. So nothing can, nothing can interrupt that. Nothing can disturb that. Nothing can, um, nothing can make that go off the rails. Uh, nothing you do or fail to do can ever make your peace with God go off the rails because God's love for you is not dependent on what you do or fail to do, as you hear me say all the time, it's dependent entirely on what Jesus has done for you. God has made peace with you in the person and work of Jesus. So we have objective peace. The subjective peace, the peace of God, is something that kind of ebbs and flows, you know? It comes and it goes. Um, when things are going well, we seem to have more of it. And when things aren't going well, we seem to have less of it. But so often we can get confused and think that when this is missing... There's, there's been an interruption here, but there's never, there can't be an interruption here. So, so um, would you say that the more we understand why we needed peace with God and the more we believe that we have peace with God, peace, the peace of God horizontally is, is more present? Like yes. our belief, which leads me into this next question, which was in part three. You talk, you entitled it. Uh, you, what did you help me believe? Okay. And so it was about Paul in that passage praying belief into the people, and in order to have the peace of God horizontally, our belief in what He's already done for us creates that. It it manifests that in our life more. Yes. Um, so just talk about praying belief into people and like the need for us to believe what is true, um, how, that, how that helps us to have just peace no matter what the circumstances are. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think, like I said a few minutes ago, believing that God's love is unconditional, that we don't have to earn his favor, that we don't have to merit his acceptance, that we don't have to do certain things to get God to like us, um, that God's disposition of us does not change based on what we do or don't do, that his disposition toward us is always the same because of what Jesus has done for us. That is a very difficult thing to believe. It's very difficult to believe. It, it, it's actually impossible to believe on our own, impossible. Um, because everything else says something different. Our world says something different. Our hearts say something different. Other people say something different. Um, we, in, we come into this world believing that if we're going to get respect, if we're going to get love, if we're going to get approval, if we're going to get acceptance, uh, if we're going to get significance and security, we have to work for it. We have to go out and get it. We have to earn it. Um, and so while that may be true in this world, we tend to then impose that or project that onto the way God deals with us. And the Bible is there to remind us that that is the exact opposite of the way God deals with us. In fact, I think I referenced it last week where Paul in Corinthians, the Apostle Paul in Corinthians says that God in Christ was reconciling the world to himself not counting our sins against us, mm -hmm. but rather counting our sins against Christ. Mm -hmm. um, so you've heard me quote that old hymn, in my place condemned he stood and sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah. We've been singing about it. What a savior. Um, and, so, um, and so that is a very, it takes God given faith to believe that that's true. Mm -hmm. um, it takes, in order to believe that that's true, we need God to give us the faith to believe that that's true. 
We can't conjure that up. We can't make that up. We can't work to get that belief in our head. Um, And so Paul, the Apostle Paul, recognizes that when he comes to the Ephesian Christians that he's writing to. And so beginning in verse 15 down through verse 22 or 23, Mm -hmm. I think, um, he prays a prayer and essentially says, everything I've just said about you, God, and how you love these Ephesian Christians, I, I want to pray that belief into them. They're not going to believe this unless you cause them to believe it. So cause them to believe it. Um, give them eyes to see and ears to hear that it's true, that they are adopted children of God, that they have been reconciled to you. Regardless of how unreconciled the rest of their lives may be, you have reconciled them to yourself. The most important and primary relationship has been firmly and eternally established, even if every other relationship falls apart, if every other part of our life falls apart. And what we tend to do is think, when life's falling apart, my relationship with God, or it's, it's, it gives evidence to the fact that there's some lack in my relationship with God. And so um, I have to, sort, if I want my life to go better, I gotta, I gotta repair things with God. Okay, as if it's up to us that if the secret sauce to an easy and better life is to make sure that everything with God is good, and in order to make sure that everything with God is good, I have to do it. Mm-hmm. Well, that's just, you know, that is, that is a, as my friend Steve Brown says, a lie from the pit of hell and smells like smoke. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just, it's what the devil wants us to believe about God. Mm-hmm. He wants us to believe that God's love for us is conditional. He wants us to believe that we have to earn our way into God's affection. He wants us to believe that uh, God doesn't give us any room to really screw up. You know, I've said this before, but I do not, and I understand the sentiment behind it, um, but I've never liked the phrase, uh, God is a God of second chances. Because... I just need a hell of a lot more than a second chance, man. I just do. I mean, I need way more than a second chance. Um, I need need more than a second chance in the first 20 minutes I'm awake every day, okay? So... um, so I just, you know, I, I, it's much better to say God is the God of one chance and a second Adam, namely that we blew it and God in Christ has made things right forever, Um, And so that is, um, you know, that's what Paul's doing in those verses that you referenced in part three of the series, Mm -hmm. is he's praying that truth into these people and asking God to cause them to believe. And we need to be doing that for one another. And Um, isn't that different than, I know I grew up uh, in a denomination that put a lot of pressure on me and other people in the congregation, and I know a lot of people that we talk to feel this, that they feel the pressure to save people, to um, bring them to Christ, to lead them to the Lord, to help them. Like, And here, Paul is saying, I'm praying to God because he's the one that does that. So he's really taking the power out of Um, his own hands other than that he's praying to God for it to happen because where and when we believe it is a gift from God it's not something that you or I can manipulate into someone's heart and mind it's something only God does but a lot of time churches and people in ministry we understand that differently and we understand we feel like it's our job uh, in some way to save someone which is different than evangelizing to someone and praying for them can you Say anything about that? I know yes, you can. Yes, I agree. I- <laughs> yes, I mean, to just well, put, tie a nice little bow on that. Yeah, I mean, you can't fix people. You can't change people. You ultimately can't save people. Right. Um, that's God's work. And so, you know, I mean, Paul says it. I, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gives the increase. I mean, we see this all over the Bible where, yes, we do our part and we, we pray for people and we love people, uh, but ultimately God is the one that does the heart work that needs to be done. We can't do it. Um, we can be... We can be friendly to people, we can be loving to people, we can be caring and attentive to people, which we ought to be. Um, Quick story um, about that, and I think this has helped me for many, many years. Um, 
years ago, uh, this is a great story. Some of you have heard me <laughs> tell it. Years ago, late 90s probably, I think it was the late 90s. It was when Bill Clinton was president, so it was his second term. The Lewinsky scandal was sort of at its height, so probably late 90s. And my granddad was invited to New York City to go to uh, Time Magazine's 75th anniversary dinner. And if anybody who had been on the cover of Time Magazine was invited to come, so he went. He was invited to go, and he went. And he, um, he, my grandmother was not well enough to travel at that point, so he took my mom. And, uh, and before the event, um, the organizers called my granddad's people, <laughs> And basically said, hey, listen, we originally had you seated at the president's table, but given the circumstances and our desire to protect your reputation, we've decided to put you at a different table. And he basically said, um, if you put me at a different table, I'm not coming. And he didn't say that because he didn't have access to the president. He had, he had access to the president anytime he wanted. He said that because he wanted to make it very clear that his savior... Uh, ate with sinners, and so will he, that he didn't care about his reputation. He's like, I don't care. Um, so anyway, make a long story short, he went, and after the dinner, there's a funny Kevin Costner story mixed up in there somewhere, but I'll tell you guys that after the service. Uh, so afterwards, um, my mom and my granddad are riding back, to the, um, riding back to the hotel, and my mom asked him, she said, Dad, um, how are we, as Christians, how are we supposed to handle people that we know are guilty, in sin and guilty? And uh, he looked at her and said, um, it's God's job to change people. It's our job to love people, full stop. That's it. And I just, I thought about that. I'm like, that is such profound simplicity it simplifies my job description to all of you mm -hmm. and to everybody on earth. I, I don't have to fix anybody, and I ultimately can't change anybody. You can't change your wife. You can't change your husband. You can't change your children. You can't change your friends. You can't change your boss. You can't change anybody. Mm -hmm. And when you finally accept that, it's incredibly liberating because now my... my uh, my job description as it pertains to you is very simple. Love, mm -hmm. love. It doesn't say love when I'm good and don't love when I'm bad. It's love, that's it. Now we fail to do that on a regular basis and we, we tie ourselves in knots trying to save people and change people and fix people and uh, make people more of what we want them to be. We do that. Uh, but you know that when you try to do that or when it's been tried on you, it's just like, get me away. It, it makes life heavier. It makes life feel more tense. I mean, if you've ever tried, if, if you want to know what deep frustration really is, um, then try your hardest to change your spouse with everything you got. You will realize that it is a fool's errand to even try it, okay? Um, now, I happen to be married to someone who needs no change at all, so right. I'm in the clear. Right. However, she... No, I'm just he doesn't need, yeah, you don't even need brownie points. No, no, so. no, no. <laughs> um, so I, I say all that to say I think that becomes a very practical thing when it comes to relationships in general. Um, that we, maybe we're not trying to, in church terms, maybe we're not trying to save this person mm -hmm. or bring them into the kingdom of God or whatever, convert them. But just because we may not be guilty of that doesn't mean that we're not guilty of trying to change people all the time, mm -hmm. all the time. Um, and therefore, because we are prone to do that, we need to believe all of this is true, that um, God is ultimately in charge. He does the changing. He does the saving. He does the fixing, whatever fixing needs to happen. Um, he does the resurrecting. God alone does that. Which you're, you're setting every question up perfectly with your answers. So that the next thing I was going to go to is in part three and part five, you talked about loving people. And in the first part three, you said loving people from love instead of loving people to get love. Um, that was a theme that you used. And then in part five, you use the 
the examples of us using people as vehicles. People are either vehicles or obstacles to us in typically, you know, how it may masquerade as love, but it's not. So do you want to speak on those two things? Because those are, those are part of what I you're think that was about. last week, if I'm not mistaken. Last week was the vehicle and the yeah. obstacle. Yeah, um, which was, you know, something that um, I found very helpful uh, to, to sort of distill the way we view people down to two categories. We either see them as a vehicle, someone who can help us get to where we want to go, or an obstacle, someone who's preventing us from getting us to where we want to go. Uh, and we use vehicles, uh, and we remove obstacles, or at least we try to. But or the, we crash into them. <laughs> yeah. But the fact of the matter is we what that illuminates is the fact that we... Our natural disposition is to use people rather than to love people. And we do it in the most subtle ways. Mm -hmm. When my life came crashing down, when I crashed and burned, one of the most sobering realizations to me was that I didn't have nearly as many friends as I thought I had. And I've said this before, it's almost impossible when you are at the top or have a lot to offer to know who your friends are when things are good. When things are bad and when you're at the bottom and all you have to offer is leprosy and liability to people, you realize pretty quickly who your friends are. And it was very uh, daunting to me that I looked around and didn't see that I had many friends at all, which then, rather than wallowing in a pool of self-pity, I started asking myself the question, which, by the way, I did wallow in a pool of self-pity for a time, <laughs> but once that got old uh, and realized that was getting me nowhere um, and I was done feeling sorry for myself, God helped me to reflect on the fact that I, I hadn't been a good friend either. Um, and that all of my relationships, I had a great network, I had colleagues, I had, um, I had acquaintances, but I didn't really have a whole lot of real friends, even though I thought I did. Um, and I looked around and I realized, man, me and my colleagues, my network, my friends, friends, my acquaintances... We've just been using each other for years, trying to get our own ball down the field. And the people who could help us get it further became our friends, so to speak. Well, we do that all the time. Um, and part of the reason why we do that is because, in fact, I would say the primary reason why we do that is because we actually don't believe the gospel. If I really truly believe that all of the love and all of the acceptance and all of the significance and all of the approval and all of the security and all of the value and the worth that I long for and look for in a thousand things infinitely smaller than Jesus are already mine because of what God has done for me, then I'm not going to spend my life trying to extract something from you to get for myself because I don't need anything from you. Everything I need, I already have. That sets me free to now give to you without needing you to give back to me. So we use people ultimately because we don't believe what Paul has said is true about our relationship with God. We don't. Um, I mean, failing to believe the gospel has radical, <laughs> radical horizontal consequences. Okay. Uh, and all of our relationships are plagued by an aroma of conditionality. All of them. It's inevitable. Um, and the only thing that has the power to mitigate that is the gospel. Mm -hmm. Because in reality, and I think I said it last week, I, I love to receive love from my wife and from my children and from my friends. Something in me comes alive when they love me, when they encourage me, when they give to me. Um, it's something God designed us for. He designed us to be connected to one another. Uh, and there's life that flows from that. But I've learned something very important, and that is while I love to be loved by those around me, I don't need it. There's a difference between enjoying it and being grateful for it and needing it in order to matter. Those are two very different things. 
Um, the moment you are at the point where you need it in order to feel secure, in order to feel safe, in order to feel significant, um, then it becomes enslaving. And so the gospel is constantly there to remind us, like I said last week, that the keys are already in your pocket. That everything you need in Christ you have. And that now changes the way I am now able to relate to you. Um, I don't have to get my way. I don't have to win. I don't have to force my way into the right network or into the right friendships in order to feel valuable. Um, I don't need my wife to be flawless and infallible in order for me to feel like a man. Uh, I don't need important friends in order to feel important. Uh, all that kind of stuff that we're bombarded with on a daily and weekly basis, the gospel sets us free from needing any of that stuff. And man, that's when life begins to feel light. That's the abundant life that God tells us he wants us to experience, a, a, a life of lightness and liberation and freedom, because now it's not up to me to make life work and to get everything I need from all of you to fill the voids in my life. I, I don't need that. Um, so that's ultimately why the gospel is good news. <laughs> and we love that. <laughs> yes, yes, we do. We Hold on, it. let me just check the time here. All right, I have one more question. We only got six minutes, okay, so we're well, going. Okay, well, you got to shoot the answer out really quick. Right. Um, so in part four, we talk, you went over chapter two in Ephesians, and you talked about it, it starts off saying that we're found dead in our trespass and sin. Um, and then it goes on to explain what God has done for us in the person of Jesus and he's raised us to life. You entitled part four, Death to Life. Um, so dead people don't make choices. So do we have free will? Could Let's close in prayer. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have time. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. Okay. Um... Uh, <laughs> He's not dumbfounded. I know that. It depends on stumped. how free will is defined. I think we just all we just automatically assume that because we have the capacity to make choices and we do in fact make choices on a daily basis, that that means we have free will. Mm -hmm. But those are two different things. Okay, free will, properly understood, is the ability to choose any and all options available to us at any given moment. Well, we know, we know practically that that's false. I mean, I, I, um, I don't, I hate baked beans, for instance. Okay, they're disgusting He hates to me. all beans. I basically hate all beans except green beans, and even then I can tolerate green beans, but I basically hate beans, okay? I don't know why I hate beans, Nobody taught me to hate beans. I just guessed the first time I ever tasted beans. I didn't like the taste of them, and I've never acquired a taste for them. I cannot wake up tomorrow morning and just decide I'm going to like beans. It doesn't work that way. Um, I was born into this world with the inability to jump off a building and fly to my house. Okay, I can't, after church, climb up on the roof of the sanctuary and just jump off and just flap my arms and fly to my house. Okay, I don't have the ability or the freedom to do that. Um, there are a whole host of other really stupid illustrations I could give to make it plain to all of us that free will defined in the sense that we have the ability to choose any and every option before us is impossible. So let's, now, we all... Let's talk about the capacity to make choices. We all have that. Obviously, we make a thousand choices. I forget what the actual number is, but on average, we make, I think it's more like 46 or 4,700 choices a day on average. Okay, most of them we're not even conscious of, but we're making decisions all the time. Um, so the real question, as it is relevant to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10, is when it comes to God, Am I able, being dead by nature, am I able to choose God? That's really the ultimate question here. And the answer is no, ultimately. 
We, we don't. We're dead. Paul describes it. He, I told you, he uses the Greek word nekros there, which literally means corpse. Dead hey, we're people dead. don't make choices. Right, we're dead in our <laughs> trespasses and sins. When it comes to the things of God, we're dead. We're not sick and in need of medicine. We're dead and in need of resurrection. Okay, that's Paul makes that very clear. If you don't like that, don't blame me. Blame Paul, or ultimately God, uh, because that's the way he diagnoses us and describes us. So let me give you an example. Well, let, let me make a statement that may seem uh, overly philosophical, but then let me explain it by giving an illustration. When it comes to choices, here's a quick line to remember. Nature dictates desire... Desire dictates choice. Okay, I'm going to say it again, and then I'm going to explain what I mean. Nature dictates desire. Desire dictates choice. Here's an example. A lion is a carnivore. He's carnivorous by nature. He only eats meat. Okay? You could put a pile of meat on the left side of a lion and a pile of vegetables on the right side of a lion, and the lion, 10 times out of 10, is going to freely choose to eat the meat every time. Why? Because he wants to. Well, why does he want to? Because he's a carnivore. His nature is carnivorous, which means he wants the meat, which is why he freely chooses the meat every time. Now, he has the physical capacity, a mouth, a digestive system, and whatnot, to eat the vegetables, but he's never going to choose them unless his nature's changed. If he's ever going to choose to eat the vegetables, someone's going to have to change his nature. And if the nature's changed, and all of a sudden the vegetables become appealing, and they look good to him, then he may choose the vegetables. In fact, he will choose the vegetables. Um, so when it comes to God and us, Paul describes our nature. We're dead in our trespasses and sins. He, he uses even harder terms. We are hostile to God. We are born children of wrath. I mean, he uses some pretty heavy terms to describe who... Well, Lord, have mercy. Let's pray. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> Two more minutes. Um, so he uses some pretty... He uses some pretty bleak terms to describe our condition before God saves us. Our nature is sinful. So you put in front of us, before God resurrects us, you put in front of us a pile of God and a pile of sin. We are going to choose the pile of sin every time. Why? Because we want to. Well, why do we want to? Because our nature is sinful. In order for us to want God, our nature is going to have to be changed. In order for us to choose God, we're going to have to want God. And in order for us to want God, our nature is going to have to change. And God is the only one who changes natures. We can't change our own nature. Which is why, back in Ephesians 1, Paul makes it very clear that our rescue is all of grace. That God the Father appointed it before time. God the Son accomplished it in his time, and God the Spirit applied it in our time. Mm -hmm. So God's saving of us, his rescue of us is all of grace, which is why we can never, which is why we can never lose it. Mm -hmm. We didn't earn it. We didn't get it. We didn't work for it. We didn't, we didn't dot the right I's and cross the right T's and connect the right dots in order to get it, okay? Um, we didn't solve the problem and therefore get the reward of rescue. Uh, God did all that. And so his rescue, our rescue, is all of grace. And it doesn't matter what your life may look like from this point forward because you're going to screw up and you're going to fall and you're going to fail. You do it all the time. We do it all the time. Um, we're more selfish than we think we are. We're more prideful than we think we are. Um, we're, we're more... Um, lustful and greedy than we think we are. I mean, as I've said before, quoting um, old Presbyterian minister Jack Miller, who said, cheer up, you're a lot worse off than you think you are, but God's grace is infinitely greater than anything you could ever ask for or imagine. And that's really the, the essence of the gospel. It's the essence of God's law and God's gospel. The essence of God's law is to expose the fact that we need Jesus. 
that no matter how good we think we are or how strong we think we are or how righteous we think we are or how clean we think we are, we're a lot dirtier and weaker and unrighteous than we like to admit. So the law exposes that. When Jesus says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect, it's supposed to expose the fact that no matter how good we think we are, we still fall woefully short of God's standard. Mm -hmm. Well, when that hits us like a ton of bricks, now we begin to recognize our need for Jesus. Mm -hmm. And we begin to look at what God has done for us with tremendous gratitude because we realize we could have never done this for ourselves. We can't resurrect ourselves. We can't change our own natures. We can't pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. We can't have enough quiet times or pray enough prayers or go to enough church services or give enough money in order to earn our way into God's favor and get God's blessings. Um, it's, it's God's work from beginning to end. And the irony is when that grips your heart, okay, because some people will say, well, but if you really believe that, it would cause people to get lazy and apathetic. But we know functionally that that's just false. Mm -hmm. I have never met anyone in my life whose heart has been so gripped and so grasped by God's love and grace to them while they're at their worst that it makes them want to sin more. Never, ever. Uh, I am stunned and amazed by the fact that despite my messiness, God's mercy is never ending. And that realization makes me love him more, not less. It makes me want to hang out with him more, not less. Um, so again, I think it's one of the it's one of the horizontal implications of the gospel um, that when we, by God's grace, believe this to be true, it sets us free in 10,000 different ways. In fact, it sets us free in ways that ultimately, in many cases, we didn't even know we were enslaved to. It, you'd be shocked. Uh, you may not be. But my guess is you'd probably be shocked if you realized just how enslaved you were to certain things, needing someone's approval, needing to get respect, needing a certain level of financial security, needing your father to think of you in a certain way, needing your marriage to feel a certain way. There are, there are things that are so much smaller than Jesus that we literally depend on to make us feel like we matter. And those things ultimately enslave us because they're not God. Mm -hmm. They can't do for us what only God can do. Um, so... Well, there you go. That, that was it. I don't have any other questions. Well, we don't have any more time, so that's okay. perfect. Well